Hello and welcome to the Satellite Tracking Channel. I'm Scott Tilley and today we're going to discuss why amateurs track satellites in space. Amateurs began tracking satellites shortly after the launch of uh, Sputnik 1 and its rocket booster in October of 1957. This event triggered a, a shock around the world but also gave rise to the ability to study the upper atmosphere and the actual shape of the Earth. Uh, given the perturbations caused by uh, these uh, uh, phenomena on the actual satellite's orbit. Amateurs, under the auspices of Operation Moonwatch, sponsored by the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in the U.S., and the equivalent Optical Tracking Subcommittee of the British National Committee for Space Research in the U.K., amateurs routinely made their observations with very simple equipment, often as simple as a set of binoculars, a stopwatch, and a star chart they would observe a satellite passing by a uh, formation of stars and time the passage with the stopwatch. The stopwatch in turn would be calibrated to a reference like WWV or CHU in Canada. By the mid-1970s, funding for Operation Moonwatch had uh, evaporated and the program was shut down. By the mid-1980s, the equivalent uh, program in the UK began winding down operations with its last funding and activity occurring in 1990. The U.S. Air Force, since the dawn of the space age, was the only uh, public agency around the world releasing orbital elements for most, if not all, of the spacecraft in orbit that they could track. In June of 1983, the United States Air Force began classifying the uh, orbital elements of military missions. In fact, they went as far as retroactively redacting orbital elements that had been publicly published in the years earlier. As the 1980s evolved, and the, the uh, professional sponsored observing programs dried up, amateurs shifted their interest towards the spy satellites. So why in June of uh, 1983 did the U.S. Air Force suddenly and without fanfare begin classifying and redacting from publication uh, orbital elements that had been made public previously? It is believed that it was the beginning of a clandestine operation to veil the uh, uh, existence of the new KH-12, or MISTI satellite. MISTI was a program to develop satellites that were uh, stealth capable and difficult or if not impossible to track while in orbit. Like any complicated uh, uh, technological endeavor, the MISTI program would have required years to develop. So it somewhat makes sense that in June of uh, 1983, uh, around the time that the MISTI program was announced, that they would begin redacting the elements of military payloads. One could reason that this could give the uh, U.S. government time to create a uh, plausible cover for the fact that they would be launching maybe five to ten years' time stealth satellites into orbit. This would create a new normal. A new normal where military payloads were not publicly discussed or disclosed about where their locations would be. However, amateurs continued to track these objects because they were visible in the night sky. At first, the elements that were redacted uh, were only for uh, particularly sensitive missions, the image uh, intelligence missions, signal intelligence missions, and other ones that played a tactical role, uh, such as the uh, intruder or naval uh, observational surveillance satellites. Um, bizarrely, in 1999, the uh, U.S. Air Force expanded its ban on the publication of uh, military uh, uh, satellite elements to uh, less operational or less uh, um, sensitive military missions such as the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program and even GPS. Um, this is rather bizarre because the GPS satellites themselves actually transmit their orbital elements down uh, in such a way that any GPS receiver or uh, equipment related to that could uh, publicly decode and, and obtain their orbital positions. It didn't take long for amateurs to start to decode this and post it publicly on CSAT-L. MISTI was intended to be uh, uh, practically invisible to the Soviet Union. Up until this point, surveillance satellites were very large and very visible in the night sky. MISTI's mission would be to create a sense of mystery for the enemy uh, or our opposition in, in their ability of not being able to track the satellite readily. This would create uh, an environment where the, uh, the American MISTI satellite could potentially 
catch uh, uh, opponents in the act rather than having them uh, disguise or, dis uh, or cover up their activities as uh, optical surveillance satellites passed over top. In Jeff Richardson's book, uh, Wizards of Langley, he reported that the MISTI program had received budgetary approval in 1983. So the policy prior to June of 1983 of publishing all of the military uh, orbital elements uh, would have made MISTI's mission redundant. So a means was needed to create plausible uh, reason for not publishing uh, this, the elements for MISTI when the mission was actually launched uh, for the first time. So what so it's presumed that the U.S. Air Force did was start to redact the orbital elements long before the MISTI program would ever reach orbit. This would give them the ability to plausibly deny uh, the existence of the MISTI program by not just suddenly, uh, after they launched the MISTI spacecraft itself, uh, start to redact the orbital elements for it alone or other military payloads, and thus draw attention to itself and the fact that they had launched a, uh, a stealth satellite into orbit. By creating a new normal in June of 1983, MISTI-1 finally launched in the spring of 1990 on the uh, space shuttle mission STS-36, uh, entered orbit in an environment where everybody expected military missions to be in classified orbits and not to be publicly disclosed. Only a select few individuals remained in the amateur tracking community that had the skills and time to, uh, to track uh, satellites in orbit, but it didn't take long for amateurs to pick up on the MISTI-1 mission. As in the case with MISTI-1, amateurs continued to monitor uh, classified uh, military missions uh, since 1983 and have developed a catalog of over 400 objects uh, that we are currently tracking in orbit that are considered uh, classified by the U.S. Air Force. Ourselves and a number of other uh, entities around the world also keep an eye on uh, uh, satellites in orbit and track these classified missions. So why do amateurs continue to track these classified space missions? It allows us to uh, practice our skills in tracking satellites and also study orbital dynamics and other uh, of the uh, physical uh, um, properties of, of spacecraft in orbit. It gives us that sense of the unknown because you're tracking something where you can't really check your results. Uh, you just need to do it and see if it's there the next time it comes around. And as we develop better and better orbits and then maintain observations of these satellites over time, uh, it allows us to hone our skills. The other side of it is the geopolitical and, uh, aspect of, it, of the uh, activity. In 1967, uh, most of the spacefaring nations of the world, particularly the Soviet Union and the USA, entered into the Outer Space Treaty, where they agreed that uh, space would be largely a non-military environment and no weapons of mass destruction. But who's really providing an independent observation of what's going on in space? Well, you would think the UN would be. They are to some degree, but they rely on the member states uh, of the Outer Space Treaty to report their uh, spacecraft in orbit and what they're doing and where they are. Unfortunately, some nations, such as the United States, don't provide prompt or accurate information to the UN about where their uh, uh, military uh, missions are. In fact, the United States is well behind in publishing uh, a lot of its recent space activities to the UN, while nations such as Russia, China, uh, uh, Great Britain, etc., are much more punctual in providing the UN with uh, important uh, information about their space activity. So, you've got this bunch of guys around the world tracking classified military payloads. So an astute viewer might ask the question, wouldn't this compromise the national security of their respective uh, countries or the, uh, the national security of another nation? Well, there's nothing illegal about uh, amateur observers looking at and reporting on the positions of objects in space. One might even add that if an amateur with such limited funding and capabilities can provide accurate orbital elements for uh, 400 uh, plus uh, military payloads in orbit and systematically keep track of that data over time, surely a small country with much more means uh, and uh, manpower could do the same or more. What it does point out is that with very simple means, an individual or a small group of people can keep track of what's going on in orbit. In the end, amateurs provide a level of transparency uh, into the use of space by the various nations of the world.
amateurs, whether they're actually active tr actively tracking satellites or actively uh, reviewing pub published uh, news and reports of activity in space, uh, call out the uh, nations of the world to be more transparent about what they're doing. After all, that's what the Outer Space Treaty was all about. It was about uh, uh, establishing rules of orderly and peaceful use of outer space. And ultimately, uh, in the mid-1970s, uh, the uh, uh, registration convention of the, uh, of the uh, International Outer Space Treaty asked the nation states of the world to advise on what their missions were doing and give uh, enough information about their trajectories and orbits that there would be a certain level of understanding by all users of space what was going on up there and potentially lower the uh, political and geopolitical uh, uh, temperature at the time. Thanks for watching uh, this episode on the Satellite Tracking Channel. Uh, please, uh, if you liked the episode, please click like below. And uh, if you really uh, would like to learn more about satellite tracking, please click the uh, subscribe button. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you again soon.